Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here, checking out the series. You know what to do, like what you see, what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I put out uh, three new interviews every single week, so it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I am not lying when I say I've got one of my favorites right now on, on the show, Kate Siegel. Hello. Hi. <laughs> It's um, it is. I, I truly mean that. What you've been doing the past few years, uh, from the haunting of Hill House, and I could just go through all of them, of course. Uh, lately with Midnight Mass last year, the Astronaut's Wife. I've been uh, become such an admirer of the scripts that you're part of, the work that you're doing, the what you can do with a close up and the lines, <laughs> how you deliver it. it. You you are incredible at your craft, and I just want to throw all the compliments to you right away. Thank you so much. I spent most of my morning with my three-year-old daughter yelling. She was yelling at me, you make my heart sad. So oh. having compliments is going to balance out those scales for me. And I appreciate that. What a line. You make it my heart like sad. She, you make my mommy, you make my heart sad. Mm -hmm. And I like, I try to do this kind of quasi gentle parenting thing. And I, so I repeat it back to her. I go, I make your heart sad. And she goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that didn't so work that time. It's like in the Flanagan household. So to hear that I'm good at my job is very, very <laughs> helpful to me. Uh, I, I mean that. And um, uh, well, let's let's just start. You know, so recently it was The Time Traveler's Wife, uh, the book that became a movie that's become a show. Um, yeah. And uh, and you, of course, you play the mom of our of our time traveler. Yeah. And uh, and and I, I do also want to say, you know, here we have. Um, you know, it's there's a love story. There's meditations on death. There's there's time traveling. So there's some science fiction involved. It's not a horror show, and yet you are still involved with a very bloody death somehow. Like, is it just is it a magnet that you're drawn to, or are they drawn to you? I think um, very early on in my like acting training, I had a teacher tell me once to learn how to cry beautifully. Like now, that's kind of like some bullshit and whatever, <laughs> but. That you know, it seems that like people hire me to either fall in love or die terribly. Like that's <laughs> what I do. That's it. Like you're looking for someone to die, or, like tragically. You're gonna get Kate Siegel on the speed dial. That's One of these days, I'll get to like you know solve a murder or something. I guess it's still murder. God, maybe this is it. Like I just hey. I have a compass that always points to murder. <laughs> uh, you play it well, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, this was fun, you know. And again, I, I had I've, I've still not read the book. Um, uh, the movie I did see a few years ago and there was a point I was watching it alone and I didn't know that I was going to watch it that day. It just kind of fell into it. My wife was on her way home and she walks in at the end and I was just bawling, just like, and we were early on dating too. So this is one of the first times like, you know, it's so, so I was really interested in how this story was going to be told this time around. And it was done with such grace, especially over a long, you know, over a uh, episodic uh, period, how you did it. Um, but plus, I also love time traveling. I'm just a nut for it. Very what, cool thing, right? Yeah. What drew you to it? Was it something about that? Like, what was it about this that you wanted to be a part of the uh, the story? I was a huge fan of the book years ago. And I would often, like, bemoan the fact that it was made into a movie before I was in the, like, professional acting world. And I was like, oh, well, that one's always gone. But I'm like you. I loved the combination of romance and time travel and sci-fi and the way that the author, Audrey... Last name, I'm going to murder Nerfinger. I sure. believe you. Oh, man. Somebody drop that in the comments, please. I feel bad. <laughs> um, the way that she blends it all together really is exceptional. And then Stephen Moffat, obviously. Mm. Stephen Moffat, I've been a Whovian for like a long time. Behind me is a ton of Doctor Who stuff as well. And so it was a dream of mine to speak the words that Stephen Moffat wrote. And so the combination of those two things, it was very much like, like a moth to flame. I couldn't yeah. have stopped. Yeah, Steve, you're right. Uh, everything he's done so far and, and has some, uh, so, so, some good experience with time travel uh, himself. Yeah, yeah, he does. He gets it. He gets <laughs> Stephen it. Moffat. There are those lines though. That's all through here. The thing that, I, I, I took away from the series more than I ever did the movie because with the movie, I think I was stuck on the time traveling. I was stuck on the love story and, oh, what's happened to him? You know, he's, he's going to yeah. die. But with this one, I guess because there was more time spent, there was that, as I said, a meditation on mortality quite right. a bit more when when the line was delivered. 
it's always later than you think and this is the only time you ever get again <laughs> there i was just like that's that those that those but like was it was it in the conversation that this was going to be so much more of a focus for you all uh what do you i'm sorry one more like with with, with like more of like mortality than oh, just the love. it's not just a love story yeah, there was some so there's this idea annette who was the character name of the character i play in time traveler's wife she doesn't really exist in the movie and she's kind of an afterthought in the book. So she's an entire creation made fresh in Stephen Moffat's mind. And as told through David Nutter, the director. And what we talked about a lot is how memories are like time travel too. You could be walking down a street that the last time you walked down was 10 years ago. And all of a sudden you're 10 years younger, remembering the first time you saw your husband walking towards you. And so these, this kind of sense of mortality is what makes time travel possible, right? The fact that it's going to end makes every moment kind of stick to your brain a little bit better. It's that memento mori thing. And so when we were discussing who Annette was in the story and how it felt, it's this idea that she is such a powerful force in Henry's life that when she dies so suddenly, so unexpectedly, so traumatically, it kind of leaves a black hole in his life. And he keeps getting sucked back into it. Like he can't escape it. Mm -hmm. And so more than we were focused on her mortality or her death, we were focused on making her so full of life. Like so completely fill up a space. The, her Even her proposal, which is could have been just like this kind of skipped through montage scene. We wanted it to bubble and sparkle so that this character that you don't see so much of makes a huge impact. So you understand why Henry can't let it go mm. physically or emotionally. Yeah. And then, but seeing, I guess, let me do a little comparison there too, because, you know, uh, again, last year, Midnight Mass comes out. What a masterpiece of a show there. And here we are again, similar themes. There's that, there's the, you know, the dealing yeah. with the, the mortality. Do you find, you know, as you're coming at this, from Kate's side, not the character side, that you're working through something as well? Oh, absolutely. I think um, as a mom of two young kids, it's the first step you take in your life towards your own death, like towards your legacy. So there's this idea that you're your own individual person walking around in the world. And then at some point you go, I think I wanna make a littler version of my DNA. And then it starts to experience things and you realize that you have started the clock, right? Because as it grows up, as the child grows, you are fading away. Mm -hmm. And this is a choice you're making and something you confront over and over again, because they're having these firsts. And you're like, oh, m I may have a handful of firsts left, but mostly I have lasts left. Like the last time I pick up my daughter, the last time I... Um, she needs to fall asleep in my arms. I have a lot of lasts left and she has mostly firsts left. And in these moments, I feel like Aaron at the end. I remind myself that I'm a drop of the water returning to the ocean, that it's all us. Like it's me, I'm my daughter, my daughter's me, I am you, you and we're so connected that I don't think there's any way for me to play the characters I play if I don't think the thoughts that they're thinking and try to relate it to my life, because that's my job, right? I take these insane circumstances. My throat has been ripped open by a vampire angel and I'm dying in a great, like who, who's going to look at that and go, I don't know if that's how that goes. <laughs> right. But what I need to do is take that completely insane moment and filter it through extremely personal, <clears throat> a specific point of view to make it relatable. So that on some level you go, yeah, I believe that. I believe it. Mm -hmm. And so like good acting is when the actor can feel the emotion themselves. And great acting is when I make you feel an emotion. That's the magic. Yeah. Because even like, you know, the 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 monologue that, you know, I, I know we talk about a lot, you know, what happens when we die. It's not just entertainment. It's useful. Like it's helpful. It's so useful. Um, I was watching Contact the other day, which is my favorite movie of all time. And um, I, in it, Jodie Foster goes and she like sees her dead dad with the alien. Spoiler alert. It's a movie from the 90s. Like I can't. Come on, people. <laughs> but at one point, um, she 
he the dad picks up the all the sand right and in the sand glitters stars on his palm and i turn to mike and i go there are more universes in the thing than grains of sand in the thing and he was like yeah yeah that's right here and i was like oh every day every day <laughs> it's always there but it's true i mean all you said like I have a son who uh, starts high school next week, in a week and a half. Oh. And I think about those, those, you're uh, like, there is a line, I, I feel like I'm probably pulling it from another movie or somewhere, a song, I don't know, mm -hmm. but it says, it's basically like, because once we become parents, we become memories. We're here to be memories, yeah. you know? Yes. That's the whole thing. And um, oh. yeah. Anyway, Ooh. that's what I'm taking through a lot of your work right there. That's what it's speaking to me. So that's, that's yeah, not a question. That's just that. another compliment. <laughs> I hope it brings you healing and I hope it brings you a sense of joy. Yeah, every bit of it too. Um, further on, I couldn't bring up Midnight Mass. The scream is one of the greatest screams, I think, in history. <laughs> in the boat. To be present <laughs> in a moment like that, to have to deliver that, not just a line, but this mm -hmm. guttural, emotional thing. Like, is there a place, is there a reserve that you still are able to turn to for that kind of a thing? Like, what is that? I mean, um, there's a couple of things. Uh, 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 for that one in specific, uh, we were we were in like deep pandemic, right? And so everyone was terrified and everyone was unsure and we didn't know if the world was over and we didn't know what was going on. And I think I, I was, tapping into that sense of screaming into the abyss. Like, what the fuck is it? Ooh, am I allowed to curse? You like are, that? cuss is all you want. Great, I was like, what the fuck is this world? What is happening? And then um, I did a ton of research about how long it would take a human body to burn in that way and what it would smell like and the different stages of that. And I like, did a little bit of like getting the pictures, like getting some visuals for myself. And then I just gave myself the freedom to go there and like, see if it, what it is in those moments is you have to be kind of unafraid to embarrass yourself. Mm -hmm. Cause I was like, I'm going to try something. And this is the first day of shooting. Like, no, this is day one of midnight mass we're in this boat, which is not in the ocean. It is on like two apple boxes surrounded by green screen. I've never met Zach before. Like we did a chemistry read and this is the first day we're working together and we're doing the entire boat scene. And so at a certain point, I just had to say to him and to Michael Fimyari and Mike Flanagan, who you know knows me, I was like, I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna scream excessively long. And I'm just going to keep going until I, I wanted that feeling of she was still screaming, but there was no more sound left because it takes so long for a body to burn. It takes so long yeah. and it smells so confusing. Like there's like, that's a some, word for it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like pork a little bit like bacon. And then it's like the burning hair. And then the, his shoes would smell different when they burn the rubber and just even thinking about it, it feels like I want to scream again yeah. because of insanity. And then the insanity of the fact that the story he told me is the truth. And then Aaron's in shock for pretty much the rest of the show until um, the gun comes out in the church. Yeah. And the way it just echoed over those credits. I mean, I will never forget just both of point. our jaws just you know, everybody, I'm sure everybody had that same reaction for that. With the relationship that, that, that you all have, do you get that say in your characters a lot in the, in the, in the writing part of it as well? I'm sure that's one of those usual questions, like, you know. No. Um, yeah. What I love about working for Mike, my husband, is that there's a, a, a very clear separation of like church and state. Like at work, he's my boss and at home, I'm the boss. So <laughs> it's a nice balance. But I think he is like a living genius when it comes to writing and creating. And so I don't want a say, I want to get what he gives me. And cause I have complete faith in what he creates. Like, I think there's collaboration between any actor director relationship, but certainly we don't have one that's like out of the norm because mm -hmm. what he delivers is so beautiful and so complete and quite possibly better than anything I could ask for. Yeah. 
Yeah, because that's one of those. I mean, I think, you know, as fans, we're always kind of it, it's the same way with music. When you hear that two amazing songwriters yeah. cohabitating, you're like, what is that like? You know, is are you just, just writing music all the time? You know, that's it's yeah. mostly us watching Dark Place with Garth Marenghi. <laughs> You know, I, so the music side of things, we, we were definitely going to yeah. get to that. In 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 the astronaut's wife, you 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 do play an opera singer, and mm -hmm. uh, and and the actual singing. That's uh, did I read right? Gabrielle Rees, right? That's yes, yes. yeah, that's uh, a little off stage. Although, magic. fun fact, I did sing on the day, <laughs> and I'm not a great singer, <laughs> and so like, let me paint the picture for you. I'm standing on the stage at this like a the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is an iconic mm -hmm. opera house. I am in that <clears throat> full getup. They are playing playback. There are over a hundred extras in the audience, and I am singing that aria. The because I trained with Susan Graham, this amazing opera singer, for months beforehand to get the breathing down, and I sound like somebody is strangling Gilbert Godfrey. I swear, <laughs> God, it was so funny I could not handle it so like god bless all those extras who like went on that um background actors who went on that ride with me because I sang every note of that aria to the best of my ability <laughs> well done as you said with the scream I mean letting yourself you know possibly get to, to that oh, I don't know the most embarrassing yeah. the most embarrassing moment of my life yeah <laughs> well uh, so let's head back in time because we're here you know I'm surrounded by all of this what is your musical story like like who are your coming of age artists? Like who are the ones that, that, you know, took you there? Oh, so my family is like a Venn diagram of singer songwriters and musical theater. So mm -hmm. on one side, I have like Paul Simon and Pete Seeger and Neil Diamond and Peter, Paul and Mary and all of this like sort of hippie music from my parents. And then I have like Miss Saigon, Guys and Dolls and things like that. That's so like nothing about my music taste is cool. I was saying that that this gave me a little bit of the chills because it gave me a flashback to middle school when I wore a Grateful Dead t-shirt to school and like the cool music kids pulled me aside and they were like, name three songs. And I was completely incapable of mm -hmm. doing that. And then I went home and listened to a bunch of Grateful Dead and now I'm into it. But like, <laughs> I don't have cool music taste. Like for me, um, I'm always more connected to the lyrics. Like I'm really, was really like a huge Ani DeFranco fan, Fiona Apple, like all that, like original Riot Girl stuff, Alanis Morissette. Mm -hmm. And, but music is a huge part of my process. Like every character has a playlist. Every character. Really? Has, yeah. Yeah. So, so, and that's, that's something you put together before, like oh, as absolutely. you're, as you're creating and the character. Mm -hmm. And like each set, each scene has a couple of songs I like to listen to before I get to set. So like it gets me in a feel. Yeah. I'm going to be seeing Ani next week, which <gasps> I think that's next week. Yeah. I love yeah. her. She's on the, uh, the, it's the 25th of the, uh, the clip. Let's clip uh, the uh, album. Like, yeah. I think that's the Living one I'm trying clip. to remember. Yeah. Living in clip. Living in clip. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, she's incredible. And she's I mean, incredible. And all the ones that you mentioned, I mean, I think we're around the, the same age anyway. I, I'm I'm yeah. 40. And so that was, you know, that that prime era stuff coming in right there. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, all, all of that. So, like, I, I don't know if you can, if, if I'm putting you on the spot by asking you that, but as we're talking about specifically these two characters, you know, one from The Astronaut's yeah. Wife and one's from Midnight Mass, like who, what were the playlists? What were the difference in those playlists right there? I'm going to pull them up for you right oh. now. Oh, and I'll not even on the spot because you've got it on hand. I did my, I was like, I'm going on a music podcast. This is what the cool kids do. I better know. <laughs> um, so let's see. We have got uh, Annette, Annette's playlist is called Annette Supernova. And that is the stuff that I did to make me feel like a diva all the time. So we have some Doja Cat. We have Midnight Train to Georgia. We have Flo Millie um we have some cardi b and then i have both of the arias and then i have uh, jennifer hudson's version of memory from cats mm -hmm. um and then uh i still believe from miss saigon take me or leave me which is adina menzel from rent and those are the modern versions of the arias i was singing so because i don't speak italian right. i would listen to the modern remakes of like the La Boheme becomes Rent, right? 
and uh, Madame Butterfly becomes Miss Saigon. And so I would find the updated version to get the emotional feel because I couldn't tr like live translate the Italian. So that's Annette. And Aaron had two playlists. Aaron had Aaron Always for all the sad stuff, which is a lot of like Leonard Cohen, Ben Folds, um, uh, Ani DeFranco, and Vance Joy, Brandy Carlisle, um, Harper Simon, who is Paul mm -hmm. Simon's son. Love that. Which which um, Harp which Harper's song? Wishes and stars. Wishes and stars. Oh, that's yeah. a good one. That's, that's a great a one. one. We got Patty Griffin. We got some Counting Crows for Aaron because she's oh, a wait. nine year old. Right here. Counting Crows right behind me there, <gasps> Mr. Adam Duritz. Oh. You can't tell, but yeah. Love. Also, he dates hot chicks every time. Um, <laughs> and then Aaron's other uh, sad, like more like aggressive once all the shit hits the fan and the angels around was a lot of Kanye West, like Follow God, Wash Us in the Blood, um, Captain Hook by Megan Stallion, uh, and then some like other things to pull me out of it, like like BTS, Dynamite, and Blackpink doing ice cream, and Nicki Minaj doing Megatron. <laughs> like these are, there's just a lot of stuff to get you hyped, you know? Right. Right. And I, I loved how that works, though, because obviously we know how that works in our day to day. You know, you, you need to feel something you go towards a song, but especially like I'm not an actor. Uh, and but but I would imagine like to to have to lose yourself in whatever kind of depth that you yeah. put yourself in, like to have Nicki Minaj pulling you out like that's got to be some sort of like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like, for me, it's like the ins and outs of it are the important part. Like I can lose myself in the character for hours, but I need to know when it's over. Like I need to know, especially with someone like Aaron, where like you feel it in your body and it's like a lot of tension and a lot of exhaustion. I need to just like, like just scream along with some Nicki Minaj or like, just like get in there with Princess Nokia and like really remember that it's just, it's just playtime. It's not yeah. real. Yeah. As we're as as the folks were saying, the, uh, the your Vecna songs now, uh, the uh, the Stranger Things reference there. That's, yeah, that's now your... my Vecna song is "Obvious Child" by Paul Simon. Mm, see, that's it. I went on a, a huge like years long. So quick story. Um, I don't know how much time we got. Right, I'll start wrapping up. But um, um, my son, when he was about to turn nine, and we're we're a co-parenting divorced family, it dawned on me that we could live out the lyrics to Graceland and take the trip my traveling town. companion is nine years old he is a child yes. of my first marriage four boys pilgrims and families we're all going to graceland so we did the trip me and him we got in the car and we played it out the entire just so we could do that like paul simon is a guiding lights around our house wow. so i uh i'm there with yeah. you on that yeah that's how i um i always think of my relationship with mike as hearts and bones because mm -hmm. it's like one. Yeah, that's the other one. And like, why don't we drive through the night, make it down to Mexico? Like all of that feeling. Why don't you love me for who I am, where I am? Oh, God, God, God. I mean, <laughs> to get Paul. Where's Paul? Paul Simon. Where, he just popped up at Newport's out of semi-retirement. He, he, he was the day before Joni Mitchell came back and it was going to be big news. And then Joni Mitchell came back and everybody forgot that Paul Simon just came out of retirement that's for a day. So. <laughs> He's one grumpy motherfucker. I love it. <laughs> Uh, that's a hell of a song right there. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, you all deserve so many awards for these shows. I feel like the Emmys just, I don't know what's going on there, but you all should win a million of them for Midnight Mass. And I know that's really not, uh, happening in that way right now. I, yeah. Do you think it's an actual crime that Hamish wasn't nominated? It's a, an actual crime. Like yes. that I don't understand. There's no better performance this year. What yeah. he did with those homilies. It's insane. The fact that like, and he's playing an old man in a young man's body and a priest. It's insane. And if Hamish is nominated, why isn't Mike not? Like the rest of us, maybe like who, but the Hamish and Mike of it, really, I was like, how dare you? Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I know I'm supposed to be cool and not care, but that one stung. But when you have, when you have a script like this, when you have performances like this, and I'm not going to try to go too off the rails because I'm with you on the passion on this. Like, how who who didn't see this you know it's it's incredible i say I that as a know. compliment to all of you all what thank you're doing you. is incredible thank yeah thank you so much yeah and and with everything else again the the time traveler's wife i cannot wait to see what happens with the next movie i know that's a uh, pretty hush hush on that right now we're talking about the the fall in the house of usher that's um mm, yeah uh 
thanks for oh, taking the time good. yeah to yeah. uh to, to 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 talk about all of this uh i love what you um, do. i will give you one little hint about usher which is that my character's number one go-to song is don't bite by doja cat okay that's i'm taking that now, now when i watch that that's what i'm going to be thinking you should yeah it's right yeah. on there you'll see <laughs> all right okay thank you so much it was so nice to meet you i so appreciate this all right thank you so much. What a great conversation, guys. All right. Take care. Bye. Talk to you later.